it's not easy to get clean. It is one of the most difficult things you can ever face, especially living in this country. I had an injury when I was 19 years old, a knee injury. The doctors put me on opioids as a part of a recovery process. When I was taken off, I felt really ill. So I went back to the doctors and I said, I think I have the flu, you know, can you just give me something to feel better or whatever it is, I'm just sick. And he told me for the first time in my life that I was having withdrawals. So that drew me into you know, trying to acquire it from the streets and because uh, I was withdrawing for so long. And then that started, you know, accelerated my career in, in opiate use. And uh, I didn't get clean until I was 33. I'd have like brief periods of time where I would get clean, life would start getting better again, and, and I'd, I'd regain confidence, uh, regain some trust, and sure enough, something something would happen where I would end up using or you know get a, another type of injury or, or something like that, and and it would just never stop. And then it progressively got worse and worse over the years. Uh, I ended up going to treatment. Uh, center rehabilitation uh, about 20 times and sure enough every single time I would go back home so essentially I was going back to the same environment same phone same places same faces uh, and nothing was really changing the only the only difference was I was just clean uh, but I didn't understand what recovery was Oftentimes people will ask me, why did you decide to dive into the field of addiction? I knew that within the Arab American community, the opioid epidemic was prevalent and it was swept under the rug. And I wanted to be a catalyst within my own community and offer a sense of hope to others. And I wanted to really um, tackle the stigma head on and talk about it and shed light and education and that this isn't a moral failure. This is not a lack of faith. This is not due to bad character or bad parenting. This is a disease. In the 1950s, the American uh, Medical Association actually identified addiction as a disease. So for over 70 plus years, it has been classified as such. Unfortunately, due to the stigma, due to taboo, we don't treat it as such. Objectively, we know that addiction is a disease because it is supported by science as such. However, subjectively, we look at it in the lens of it being wrong, it's a moral failure, something terrible happened here. I took it to deal with pain, right, physical pain. I took away the physical pain, but for me, it was like sort of like this allergy uh, of the body where it gave me this euphoric sense, it made me feel comfortable in my own skin. Any type of insecurity that I had went away. The opiates dealing with pain over time became less and less effective. And so I needed, I would need more and more. And then I started becoming emotionally compromised. It's what I'm doing to acquire this uh, substance. And then my moral, my core values, everything started to diminish. And it was very toxic. It was, it was extremely toxic. I became, a, I became somebody that I, I, you know, people didn't know, didn't recognize anymore. They completely transformed me. I've been using opioids since I was 17 years old, mostly heroin and uh, not I tried fentanyl a few times. I, I don't do opiates anymore. I'm actually nine months sober, a little over nine months sober. It changed my life. It made me um, more lethargic, you know, more lazy. You know, I lost a lot of jobs. You know, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't be around my family, friends. You know, it was just um, bad. What made me stop is the fact that I got into another drug and um, that really 
it made it too much. So I started uh, falling off. I just, uh, I couldn't handle it anymore. You know, I actually ended up in the street for like two weeks. And uh, I did that on purpose though, because I was depressed at the time. And I just, uh, I just left the sober living I was at and I went and stayed in the street and camped out for like two weeks. I was trying to get high. I just wanted a life. You know, I wanted a house, I wanted a car, I wanted a job, I just, it's just what I wanted. I wouldn't have tried drugs. Because it was just, uh, it's just something that destroyed my life. Like every other community throughout the United States, we know that the opioid epidemic has hit all parts of the U.S. Within our community, we tend to really trust people that wear a white coat. And unfortunately, with pharmaceutical companies pushing opioids to people, what we've seen happen here was that people just trusted that this prescription was legitimate. It does not come with consequences. It will not destroy my life. Due to the lack of education, Unfortunately, a lot of people fell into that trap. They were essentially told by these pharmaceutical companies that these drugs are not that addictive. They lied to these doctors and it was passed down through the medical community that it's okay and then we'll give you guys kickbacks uh, for prescribing this. But they were lied to. How they uh, addressed the, the, pan the epidemic for opiates was Oh, let's just give them another drug. So they were always <laughs> trying to make a dollar, no matter how it was, by covering up. So basically it was a Band-Aid over the wound. And, um, and, and many people have died from that as a result of that. And I could have been one of them. Around 2012, it was a four year period where I really needed help and I, I, I was seeking help, okay? I really wanted to stop, you know, it was no longer fun and I was trying for four years. Uh, I would go in and out of treatment, I would, you know, uh, my family would help me change locations. I went overseas to the Middle East. Yes, I was clean uh, for a while around, I was in a safe environment, but then, you know, I brought myself back with me. And again, the same environments, you know, same phone book. Uh, same social media so eventually you know those uh, I'm gonna be back in those same circles when life got a little hard you know the easy way out would be to go use and I couldn't seek a way out it, it was really really hard until um, I fully surrendered and asked for help for the first time because I just thought like okay go to rehab get clean and life is gonna be much better but that's not the case you know, there was a lot of character. So it's like, um, you know, and your drug addiction is here, right? And then you acquire all these character defects and shortcomings, and then you have this recovery, right? In its infancy stage, and then all these character, you know, you, you stop the drugs here, and then your character defects and shortcomings fall in here. Because I thought drugs were my only problem, but then drugs were a symptom of the disease of addiction. It was much bigger, it was much broader. And I didn't understand that until I got into recovery. And you know, identifying character defects, shortcomings, uh, getting honest with myself, seeking therapy, you know, underlying traumas, because these were the, the triggers, you know, that were causing me to relapse and then setting boundaries. Like I to, it was essentially relearning how to become a, a, a man. But I needed to be surrounded around uh, people that understood me. You know, I couldn't just go back to, you know, the community. I mean, really, they, they didn't understand me. During my addiction, I was just Muslim by association. I just happened to be born in a Muslim home and around people that were Muslim. But uh, did I practice that faith? Absolutely not. Opiates rewire your brain. So my perspective on life completely changed. My consciousness wasn't there. I was pretty much existing. I couldn't even comprehend the concept of believing in a higher power at the time. I would practice some things at times. I would try to, 
but uh, it was just by habit. But you know, th I was uh, de desynthesized pretty much. Like I couldn't really feel it much. When you are in active addiction, you you tend to have a career in blame. And one thing that I would blame would would be God. That would be one of my first things to do. That would be that's a good scapegoat, right? We like to blame something, and it was a good thing to blame at the time. At least I thought it was. When I got clean, um, you know, I, I joined a 12-step program. And essentially what that was, was the first one is the only, uh, first step only talks about uh, the substance, you know, whatever the substance might be. Uh, and then uh, the next 11 steps uh, were about seeking God out. I never imagined, um, you know, being on, 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 you know, hitting, hitting rock bottom, okay, and not believing and not having any faith, you know, spiritual bankruptcy, hopeless, and then, uh, you know, having that spiritual awakening where, you know, the pendulum swings, uh, uh, gaining a perspective uh, uh, on, on life itself, and then uh, getting reintroduced to um, Islam in, 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 a, in a more peaceful way, because I, I had an understanding, you know, I, I struggled in my addiction, I, I faced so much, you know, I, the lowest of the low, and, um, and by sheer miracle, I, you know, I survived. How I got back to God was through service. You know, I, I, uh, you know, I met people that would say, in order to keep what we have, we have to give it away. And I, I didn't understand that concept, you know, because I was relating it to money, like, well, you give away. But what it was is their time, right? Their, you know, time is the most valuable entity. And, and one thing that they were saying was, hey, we're on borrowed time. All we've done is take, take, take. Now it's time to give back. It's time to serve. And so I didn't understand what that was, but I was just watching, I was observing, and then, and then, uh, and then over time, by, by having the service, I was gaining a perspective, and good Muslims were coming into my life because I had, my perspective was very judgmental on Islam, my views, uh, because I was looking at the human, right? And I didn't understand that the whole point of this world is the human experience is that is your test you know to react to these things what is how are you going to react beautiful Mus uh, muslims came into my life and showed me a different way to live you know showed me uh that um it's good to be good it, it's good to serve it's good to give back and uh and then through that I, I started seeking God out because I started seeing God in, in so many different uh, uh, forms. I started seeing miracles. I started seeing change. Um, my brain started healing. I started gaining perspectives. And then I had the privilege of going to Hajj, which was a very humbling experience. I started smoking weed when I was like 13 years old and uh, I transition, transitioned into pills, uh, Percocets, uh, Vicodin, Somas and uh, at like 18, 17, 18 years old I started smoking black tar heroin and uh, I went to rehab a couple times and I came out of rehab and I started shooting black tar heroin. I started in the first place for like pain management with uh, prescription pills and then I realized that you could buy heroin for cheaper and you'd get the same effect or even more. So I just slowly progressed smoking heroin and then eventually shooting up heroin. The effects were really negative with my family. Physically I've overdosed, I've had multiple surgeries. Uh, I overdose one time really bad to the ability I lost my ability to walk I had to do like 13 surgeries so I could just be able to walk again at first they said I never would walk again but uh, I did so many surgeries and I'm, I got my ability to walk back so I'm grateful to God for that first time I went to rehab I was 17 years old I went in for smoking heroin but I wasn't willing to, to get clean at the time so I basically Learned, learned more about drugs and how to abuse them, honestly, from rehab. And then um, I got worse. My family stopped talking to me. Uh, they didn't support me. Uh, they took everything that they had from me away. And I just 
uh, had to do it on my own. Addiction is a disease like diabetes or anything like heart disease. It's, it has symptoms. It's not just something you can get off of and it's not something, it, yeah, it's choices that you make that get you there, but you have to, it's like fighting a disease. You have to get to the root problem and identify the symptoms. Drugs are just a symptom of the disease of addiction. So you're, you're addicted, you use drugs. Uh, you have to get to the why you're addicted. And addiction is very complicated. Faith had a, a big role in my uh, recovery. I want to get right with God, and um, I know it's against my religion to use drugs. And um, I pray to God, and uh, it has a, has a big role. Well, I have two kids now, so I'm I'm doing this for me, but I'm also doing it for my kids, and uh, I'm doing it just for myself, really, honestly, for myself, so I can just get to where I want to be in my life because I caught a lot of charges. I have a lot of felonies from this life, and uh, I just need to start make, righting all my wrongs. Well, when I had my first kid, um, I was using drugs, and I, I threw the drugs away. Like Before she, uh, she was born at the hospital, I threw all my drugs away, and I was like, all right, I'm going to stop right now. But addiction is so powerful that like after everything was done and I had my first child. I just I ended up falling right back into the same old habits, and then uh, I had a, I had my second child. And just watching them grow up and stuff, I don't want to end up dying, not being there for my children. And they know their father have like died from an overdose from drugs. I just don't want that to be like their story. My ex-wife actually helped me find the safe program. I was in really bad shape, and I had been I had probably been to like eight rehabs in my whole life. She told me this really good program with Rabia and Ali Sayed, and uh, she told me it's called SAFE. And I t contacted them, and I had to jump through some hoops before I could get in, and I got in. And just the combination of faith and uh, fellowship and leadership that they have shown to me uh, is part, most of the reason why I'm sober today. I feel the difference between rehab and these guys is they attack on like three different levels. They got me mental help the help with my uh, mental diseases or mental, my bipolar and all that. They attack the addiction aspect and they attack the spiritual aspect. So we all go together to a mosque on Fridays and it was just like a triple threat, you know what I mean? So they hit all the things that I needed. It affects the Muslim community greatly. A lot of people have been assimilated, a lot of Western values which is normal, right? You come here to the States, you, you, it's, that's what you do. You know, we see the, the rap, not just the rap, but the music, right? That, that justifies the use taking, being a certain way. And, uh, and then visually, you see, you know, uh, um, on television, right? Through movies, video games, these can be very influential. And uh, it, it plants the idea of why not, okay? And then now we, you know, we have people, uh, you know, in the Muslim community, people going out, um, you know, and, and interacting, and um, because it's so readily available, it becomes a social norm, and uh, and then as a result of it, it's been fatal for many in our community. It's been really, really fatal. It's such a cliche, but we need to educate ourselves. We need to understand. Uh, uh, certain levels of compassion where it can be deadly. When you're too compassionate towards somebody, it can be fatal for them because now you become the enabler. And saying to the people in the community, no, it's not okay to take these drugs. They are, they are harmful. You know, uh, and how do we do that? That's by leading by example. Many, many parents are, uh, they are in denial. And, and I believe it's more of a cultural uh, thing where my son is not a failure, my daughter is not a failure, so there's no way that she can be, he or she can be doing this. And sometimes um, it's kind of, it's, it's really hard to, to admit that you can't help your child. So it, it is either let's marry them off, you know, and then, and then bring that pain to some other female or male, and, uh, and, then, and then cause you know, and bringing a child into this world and, and cause more pain. And a lot of it is not the parents' faults because they're trying to deal with it on their own. I mean, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? So it's not easy to, to reach out for help. 
you know, it takes a great deal of courage. A lot of the families try to deal with it on their own because they, they don't believe it's a disease and, you know, you can't cure cancer at home. I started smoking marijuana when I was like 13 or 14. And then once I, once I got out of high school, I tried uh, pills for the first time and Xanax and uh, Percocets, and basically an Adderall. And after that, it was just off to the races, like kept taking pills. Uh, it was ruining my life. It was making my life unmanageable. So that's how I knew I had a problem. The first time I tried opiates, I just had my wisdom teeth removed. And I heard about it on rap songs that like they, people talking about opiates and I just saved them. my whole bottle. Instead of taking the prescription they gave me, I just took Tylenol instead. Then just took a lot of them at once after I healed. And that's what made me like opiates at first. Completely acting out of character when you're on it. That's, that's what it does. That, that's the worst thing for me. You lie to people, you disrespect people when you're using and you steal from people. You want to steal whatever you, got, whatever you have to do to get more money or get what you want, something that benefits you. You don't care about them. And these people care for you and like, they're trying to help you maybe or they love you, you know, and you're just messing all that up. Like friends, family, relationships, everything. You just mess up everything when you're, do when you're using drugs. You're a completely different person. I, I was doing things I would never do. And I was act, like disrespecting people and like doing things I would never do. Like just being a bad person. I just, you're just not a good person when you're on drugs. An officer actually told me about the program and he said he can give me some help to stop using. And a, girl, a lady named Batul Mackey, she, she brought me to, the, uh, to detox and got me into the program. And I'm forever, forever thankful to her and forever thankful to uh, Rabbi Darwish too. For, he runs the program. And they helped me, you know, they helped me a lot. Just get past this, put it behind me. The program gives you structure. It, make, it puts recovery in your life. You have to go to meetings and it just, I don't know, you're just surrounded by recovering addicts and it gives you structure, it gives you accountability. There's a lot of rules we have to follow and you just, it just makes it, I don't know, the drug testing helps, I think, and makes you want to do it. it made me want to do it. We go to Friday prayer every, every Friday with Rabi. We meet him there and we go pray and it's definitely a big role in our in our program and we're all gonna fast for Ramadan coming up this April I believe beginning of April and yeah it's definitely playing a big role for me and for everyone in the program I think it's possible to get out and I thought it wasn't possible I thought I was gonna use forever even when I came to the program I thought I'll just stop for a little and then I'll go back to it after because it's I'm, I wasn't feeling better. I wasn't getting better after I stopped, but it's definitely possible because now I'm not on any medications. I'm not, uh, I don't have anxiety or depression. I'm just feeling a lot better. And I know that it's possible for everyone if it was possible for me. Growing up, I witnessed my uncle battle drug addiction and I witnessed it cause pain to my father, his brothers, my aunts, my grandmother, my grandfather. And just growing up over all the years, I literally witnessed what addiction can do to someone. And I also witnessed the stigma. I also witnessed how someone with a drug addiction can kind of be pushed off to the side. He's a problem, she's a problem, we don't wanna deal with it. And it is very easy to turn a blind eye to something than it is to actually address it. And witnessing this as a child and then growing up as a teenager um, and when I decided to go back to school in my late 20s, I noticed that I started to see this more and more. And I noticed that people wouldn't talk about it. And because I grew up witnessing the behavior, I knew where it was coming from. I could kind of correlate the two. And so I decided that I wanted to offer hope to my community. I wanted to be a catalyst. I wanted to bring change. And really what I wanted to bring back was a sense of humanity, that these individuals are people. 
they are someone's child that is someone's son that is someone's daughter that is someone's parent and they are human they deserve to be valued they deserve to be respected they deserve a hand up my addiction didn't really um wasn't deep when i was into the ecstasy and stuff um it really fell deep when my sister died um, in 2011. When she died, uh, my best friend um, came up to me at the um, funeral and he gave me an oxycodone or oxycotton and he, w he gave it to me and he's like, this will make you feel better. From then on, I used drugs to numb myself and it worked. It brought me deeper into addiction, brought me deeper into um, staying at home, not wanting to work on myself, not, no self-development, no. My family didn't want to acknowledge uh, how they were feeling about my sister and they, it was just like pushed under and they weren't handling it the right way and I didn't know how to handle it so I used drugs and then also there was other addiction in my family and there was other trauma going on. I was being tossed around from my mom to my dad to my grandparents. I stole all my grandma's pills one day. I mean, I always stole my grandma's pills, but I remember she was in a lot of pain and I took them and she didn't have any more. And I, I realized that this was an endless cycle. And I looked at myself in, in a way that this was not ending and I felt really ugly inside and I called my cousin Rabi and um, he had this program of SAFE. I went through intense withdrawals and intense anxiety and I didn't know from where which way was what and I wanted to run away at every step and they were very patient with me at every turn and they didn't give up on me and um, like I struggled a lot. Probably at the six month mark I started feeling a little bit better because of my intense um, drugs that I used, um, methadone and benzos, they have a longer withdrawal period. Without the SAFE program and them holding me on to telling me you're going to start feeling better, pushing me to go to the gym every day and telling me to, to go steam and sauna and pushing me through the withdrawals, going to meetings and all that, structuring my life, getting me through the depression, putting me on the right meds, going to uh, psychiatry and therapy and all that. Um, I don't think I would have made it. From what we know, science tells us and data tells us that success rates are 3%. Um, we know now for opioid addiction, there are a lot of treatment options. The opioid epidemic, one good thing that came out of it was that scientists were able to explore treatment options and we, there are an array of treatment options. Oftentimes when we think of substance use, we think of like rehab, right? Um, and that is a step. Obviously, that is a crucial step. There are a few steps in recovery. The first step is, in my opinion, is acceptance. Is accepting that this has got out of line this has taken over my life. I need help. Then, you know, when someone is receptive to help, someone like a professional like Rabia or I, um, we step in and we assess what is going, what type of addiction is this? How long has it been going on? And so depending on the assessment, we know where to refer someone to treatment. 
and treatment is typically a 21 day stay at a residential facility where they are able to detach from the drug, from people, places, and things. And the goal of that is to get them to learn a new behavior within those 21 days. So science tells us that it takes anywhere between like 21 to 30 days to rewire your brain and learn a new behavior. And so essentially that is why we aim for 21 days and we would like to remove someone from their environment for that period of time. The people that I've helped over the years and the success that we've had has been very rewarding. Uh, it, it gives me purpose in this world and how we do that is by uh, sharing our experience, strength and hope, you know, showing them that, hey, you know, there, there's a different way to live. Uh, you can be Muslim in, in this country and have a good life and enjoy life and, and, and take vacations and, and be a good, you know, example. We bring them back to their faith. How we start is, uh, by doing that, is uh, going to Friday prayer and it would speak about addiction sometimes and they'd speak about resiliency and hope and strength and structure and discipline and, and th these were very powerful you know we were listening you know they would speak about the same things that we you know it was just like reassurance that helped a lot of the men gain confidence in their community again to, to, to come back because you build a resentment in, in, in active addiction you do, you, you tend to build a resentment and you want nothing to do with that community, right? Because you're only looking at the negatives, you know? But then once you get into recovery and you get Islam uh, reintegrated into your life, they, they regain hope. What we would do is when they'd have a year or more clean and um, they want to, they, they're practicing their faith, um, you know, we, we get donations from our generous community and we take them on the pilgrimage to Hajj, which has been amazing. Um, and, uh, and that helps solidify their recovery uh, the majority of the time. As far as heartbreaking stories, uh, there are many as well. Um, you know, we've had people that we spent hours and hours in interventions and we would convince them to go. And then the next day they were, you know, scheduled to go in the morning to rehab and they wouldn't make it through the night. They would overdose. We've had uh, some that have actually went to treatment and then we would have a relapse prevention plan set up for them. And they would, midway through their uh, stay in rehab, they would call me and say, well, uh, yeah, my family has convinced me to come back home. And I'm like, well, that's not a part of our plan. And um, they would go back home and, you know, they would OD in their room a, a week later. Um, there were some that would go to rehab and leave rehab and go overdose. You know, we found some in, in you know, they found them in Detroit in abandoned homes. Uh, there were some that we had very successful um, clean time, like eight months. And, you know, life would show up, some kind of event, whether it's a death, a breakup, something would happen and next thing you know, they're out in the streets and some never come back. It's not easy to get clean. It is one of the most difficult things you can ever face, especially living in this country. Faith gives us hope. And you know, when they say you're, when you're godly, you're honest. And it gives us honesty. You know, it, it gives us faith in others, as something that we never had before. Um, because you know, like the first thing you give up is trust and the last thing you get back. That's, and so, you don't even trust yourself, but for now you're taking a leap of faith in somebody else. And then that right there will help you gain your way back. Now I'm, I have six years of sobriety, alhamdulillah. Six years ago, I could not comprehend the concept of never using a substance again. Now today, I can't comprehend the concept of ever using a substance again. It's so far removed from my life that now I look at it as a sign of weakness. We take sobriety for, for granted. And a lot of us that have you know, never used a substance throughout our lives, we're like, oh yeah, I've been, you know, I've been sober my whole life. What else is new? But when, you, when it's taken away, 
and you regain that sobriety and you realize, wow, like this, you tend to have, be more grateful. And so today I'm full of gratitude. For me, it's almost as if I'm in heaven, you know, uh, you know, like if, if, if Allah grants me Jannah, that's a bonus for me. This is heaven on earth. I, because I get to experience the human experience. I get to practice my deen, you know, um, with, with confidence. I, I, I get to serve, I get to do the God's work. So I have all these beautiful opportunities uh, that I never had before. And my mother is proud of me. You know, Allah Yirhamom, I got to serve my father uh, before he passed away, um, his last three years. So he got to see me uh, get sober. And uh, so it's been just blessings after blessings. Now, life does show up. Um, you know, in the last six years, I've, I've dealt with so many difficult challenges, but again, I used the tools that were given to me to help me deal with those, with faith and getting honest about when I'm struggling, uh, going to seek counsel, relying on, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one thing that I was always told, you know, rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand what that really is.